As mass immigration into Ireland becomes the key political issue that the public are concerned about, as reflected in a number of opinion polls over the last few months, the demonstrations in communities against the emplacement of asylum centres are growing, not just in the urban areas, but even in the countryside down in Cork, in Mayo, in Dublin, in Wicklow, in Wexford, right across the country. There seems to be a growing movement, an organic movement against what is, it would appear, mass immigration into the country. In 2022 alone, over 300,000 people received personal insurance numbers from the Irish state. At least 220 of them were not Ukrainian refugees. There does seem to be a crisis in this country. At the same time, we're not able to meet housing needs. I'm joined today by one of the drivers of these movements and one of the advocates and one of the spokespersons for the movement in the Dublin area in particular, Maliki Steenson. And Maliki is going to have a chat for 20 minutes or so just about the developing movement, what the concerns of communities are and where he thinks this movement is going. Thanks for joining us today, Maliki. Thanks, Finbar. Maliki, in terms of the how you got involved in this and what your background is, could you give us maybe a minute or two on who you are and how you got involved? Well, I suppose um, I'm 60 years of age at this stage. Um, I've been involved in community and political life, all nearly all of that from, I remember, you know, sticking leaflets in doors in the early 70s saying no to the EEC. And we see where that, that has got us where you know, um, the European Union now actually dictates everything that's happening in this country. Um, I've been involved in a range of different Republican movements and I've always been active on the Republican socialist kind of side and trying to make this into a better country and, um, you know, ensure that this nation, the Irish nation, succeeds and that it's run for the benefit of its people rather than for a very small minority. The particular... and. Uh, I mean, I had stood for election a number of times and I more or less stepped away from electoral politics, say, in about 2014. I hadn't been elected yet again. Um, and with the proviso that if there were major national, national issues, I would come back and campaign on those, something like abortion, for instance, which I was involved, heavily involved in the anti-abortion campaigns for, for a long time. Um, and then the, the asylum issue, while it was tinkering away under the, the under the surface for a long time and people were starting to get concerned, it really took off, um, I suppose, with the Ukrainian war when we saw the numbers that were coming in. But in November 1920, or 2022, the government decided then that they were going to take over office blocks and uh, all of um, any building they could and put in I-pass applicants. Now, that's applicants for asylum. They're not refugees, despite what the left called them. They're people who come into this country and say they want to apply for asylum and become refugees. And their, their case, in, in not, over 90% of the cases, their cases fail. But nothing actually happens to them in this country. Um, so a, a number of people called uh, a protest in East Wall at, at what was the old ESB building. And when people say old, it's a, actually it's a new building. It'd be better to describe it as the old Wiggins Teeth building, which was knocked down actually one Sunday and despite breaches of planning permission. But these, this new building was put there. The ESB occupied it for a while while their offices over in Marion Square were being rebuilt, or Fitzwilliam Square were being rebuilt. So the government decided overnight, and people found this out on Friday night, and somebody put a post up on social media. I went along on the Saturday, I suppose not really expecting anybody to turn up, or maybe the usual half a dozen people who might, you know, be expected to turn up at any kind of a protest. And there was a couple of hundred people there. There was no organisation, there was no um, nobody in charge. So somebody had to kind of step in and a number of us discussed who would it be, and invariably they selected me to do that. So we... I dispersed the crowd and I asked them to come back on the Monday night and we, you know, see what we could do. So over a thousand people arrived on that Monday night. And that was the start of a real campaign in this country against the increase in population. And, you know, they started calling us racist. They called us fascist. They called us far right. And, you know, to people like me, water off a duck's back, it doesn't matter what you call me, I'm around long enough to to know that these are political charges that your enemies will put at you. But they were saying to, say, Mrs. Morphy, 
you're racist. And she's looking around and she's looking at our grandkids who are probably of mixed race and our daughter's maybe married to, to some foreign girl. Um, could be black, white, green or blue. It didn't really matter. And she's saying, how am I racist? I don't treat them kids any different than any other kids. So the narrative started to change and people said, well, we're not racist. And then we, we had continual protests. We started the... the when protests. was that first? When was that first meeting that a thousand people turned up? At that, that was in November twenty twenty two. Okay. Um, and it was on a Monday night. I just can't remember. It was the start of November twenty twenty two, and we then had protests every couple of nights. And we had um, we started off a, a mobile protests in the sense that we would start. They, they complained that oh well, you shouldn't be meeting and protesting outside a building that people are living in. That's their home. Now. Remember, this is a propaganda war as well. So we ha you have to kind of neutralize the propaganda arguments that the other people are trying to make. So we had protests where we moved around, we blocked various junctions, um, and we blocked them strategically for short periods, which would allow a build up of traffic, but it wouldn't inconvenience people too much, maybe a half an hour delay. Um, because you can't, if you're doing protests on the roads at night, Remember, it's people you're disrupting because people are trying to get home. The right time to do them is actually in the morning because then you're disrupting business because people are trying to get to work and it has a different impact. So we closed down the tunnel on numerous nights and it moved on to that then that we had city-wide blockades where on certain nights we would have different groups in different areas who would block their main roads. So we brought the city to gridlock. Now, we, we ran that for as long as we were achieving success and then it started to dwindle. But what stemmed from um, the East Wall protests that other communities saw how we were prepared to stand up and how we were prepared to, you know, face down the left and the political class and the NGO class and the media to, to say that this is our community. We'll decide what happens here. And you won't do anything without cons consultation with us. And other communities then stood up and started protests. And then you see um, there have been hundreds of protests and, and different groups. Today, it's Tala and Newtown and Kennedy, um, which are the, the two main ones. Uh, I mean, the Tala one, for instance, there's a building there and they're talking about putting almost a thousand people into it. Like, these are office buildings. These are not buildings that are designed for habitation. And we have 13,000 of our own people on housing lists. I mean, in Dublin alone, I mean, it's not unusual for people in Dublin who are natives of Dublin, to be on the housing list for, for 10, 15 years. And yet, uh, Roger O'Gorman tweeted in um, a number of different languages that come to Ireland, claim asylum, and we'll give you your own house in three months. And that led to an influx. We said in November 2022 that there were people coming off planes with no identifying documents, no passports, no nothing to identify themselves. And we were called lawyers, we were called conspiracy theorists and all of that. By February, the Taoiseach himself, which was Varadkar at the time, had acknowledged that that was the case. And we were simply quoting an Irish Times article from the June before that, where they said it, but they suddenly forgot that. Now it's accepted. And we see today that the government are talking about fine and airlines. Now, I can't see how that works, and I can't see how it's the airlines problem. Because if you got on a plane in Paris, London, Birmingham, um, where most of these people are coming from, you need a passport. And it's, I mean, are they seriously suggesting that cabin staff should stand on the steps and ask people for the passports getting off? And if they do that, who's to say that they're not going to lose them between the plane and the terminal building? Which is what will happen. That all a pretense, Malachi, these excuses. The government acting surprised that we have these massive numbers coming into the country, when in reality they've signed up to several and are about to sign another international agreement, which actually commits us to taking all of these immigrants in the in, in the guise of asylum seekers and, and refugees. So when the government talks about you know trying to stop them at planes, as though is there, there, is it not a real truism that in fact the government have signed this country up for this? Oh, they have. There's no doubt about that. But the people haven't signed up for it. And all of the, the comments coming from government and opposition currently 
um, what passes for opposition in this country is geared towards the June elections. It's nothing to do with actually trying to solve the problem. And once we get beyond June, then all of these things they're saying would be forgot about. I mean, there is already a, a case, for instance, last I think last December, where a man was sentenced for um, he was arrested coming out of the airport and he had 13 passports on him. So it's not a case of people are dumping their passports on the plane. They're handing them to somebody in many cases who has taken them off and then they're being reused for other people. But remember, a huge amount of people are coming in through the UK, flying from Belfast uh, into Belfast and getting the train down or the bus. So we're going to have to 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 have immigration on the, on the trains and the bus. And I was in fact told, Maliki, that and this is just a rumour in the grapevine, uh, but it was from an okay source uh, in terms of my histrionics with them and, and their, their pattern of, of being correct. And they told me that they're actually coming in on fishing boats in Cork. Well, I don't I haven't heard that one, but um, it wouldn't surprise me because Cork is a 20, uh, on the ferry. It's, it's 24 hours from France. So um, I imagine it's slightly less if you have a bit of a faster boat or a different boat. Um, but... They told us that that wasn't happening. We said people are coming in here because of the high welfare rates. They denied that. And yet again, a, a number of weeks ago, they admitted that that was the case. But this is a government, remember, that can't lie straight in the bed. Everything they say is a lie. We saw in the, in the recent referendum where when they were asked um, to produce the information that they had been provided with by, by officials, they refused. Yesterday, we see that GRIP got documents which show that the government was told quite clearly that a change to um, the definition of family to durable relationships would lead, would lead, not might lead, but would lead to huge numbers uh, more coming into the country. They denied that. Um, and what's interesting is that not one of the mainstream medias has taken this up since yesterday. And these documents are out there for anybody to read. And RTE, which is supposed to be the, the, the public service broadcaster, hasn't mentioned it. Now, that is incredible. And I mean, many of us are now convinced that we no longer live in a democracy. We're living in a dictatorship. And we have, you know, the, the talk about bringing in anti or a hate speech legislation, which is simply to stop, for instance, me and you having this very discussion, because this would, be, would fall under the hate speech legislation. We see, for instance, a... Uh, a candidate in the local elections in Kerry being getting a phone call from the local sergeant in relation to our um, election leaflet because she said something about unvetted migrants. Now, since when do the Gardaí have a role in dictating and implying that it's an offence to somebody to have something in, a, in elect electoral literature? Now, I believe fundamentally in democracy, and I think that anybody should be allowed to put themselves before the people with whatever views they want. And it's up to the people then to determine whether they vote for them or not. And if they do, they do. And if they don't, so be it. So where we, we have a situation, and if you look at the, the current situation with the Gardaí, where you have the so-called Minister for Justice, who tells you the streets of Dublin are safe, um, and they are safe if you bring an armed, uh, an armed unit with you to, to ensure your safety while you're going down Talbot Street. Um, who's now refusing to go to the, the GRA conference because Harris wasn't invited. The man who, the GRA and its members, um, almost 99% of them expressed um, no support for him and uh, that they had no confidence in him. And here we have quite clearly the Garda Commissioner now running the Department of Justice. And, and that's not something that a society can accept. Um, Just Malachi, focusing, because I know your time is limited as well, focusing in on the communities that you're working with, what are their concerns? Because all I'm seeing on social media, to be honest with you, the majority of concerns expressed in social media and also within corporate media and, and, and the state media is reflecting concerns about essentially sexual crimes that could be committed by ma males <clears throat> coming into the country unvetted. <clears throat> And uh, I would have a, a concern that there's an inherent danger there that innocent young men or men coming into the country could all be labelled as sexual predators and things like that. Um, but there seems to be a suppression of discussion on all of those other concerns about capacity issues and all that that is not being discussed about. And it would seem that, to me, there's an amplification 
of the concerns about sexual crime. And I'm not sure whether that ampl amplification is a strategy to put down this growing movement. Well, what's your thoughts on that? First of all, what are the concerns that people have? And do you feel that the media have overly focused on the concern of sexual crime? Well, uh, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, I, I think that people, if people see, particularly women, if they see a gang of young men hanging around, in today's climate, they do feel unsafe. And remember after the death of Ashley Morphy or the murder of Ashley Morphy, we were told about toxic masculinity and we were told that all men are potentially predators. That was till they discovered that the guy who done it wasn't a white Irish guy. Um, and there, there may be an over-exaggeration of that fear. But at the same time, if you look at the court reports, and I know they can be somewhat selective, there does seem to be an increase in sexual crimes, both by non-nationals and by nationals, but there seems to be a greater level of more deviant um, sexual crimes th than we would have put up with before or seen before. If you look at, for instance, the guy who worked in the nursing homes, who's now in jail, and they're now investigating, I think, up to 60 women who had Alzheimer's or dementia, who made reports about this guy and nothing was done about it. Now, I don't think, I, I know, you know, there will always be odd cases, but there seems to be an increase in those type of cases. And one would have thought that if you, you went into a nursing home as an old, an old woman particularly, that you would be looked after and that you would certainly be safe from sexual predators. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and there are another a number of different cases similar, which... I don't think in general we had before. And you have a different cultural attitude to women where women um, are, are seen as chattels. Um, and, you know, of course, you will always hear the, the stories of somebody trying to take children and people in white fans and all of that, which never actually materialized. So, but there is a fear factor. Um, but the real concerns of people in communities, if you take just Bray, for instance, Recently, a new, a new GP surgery was needed or was opened, and it's been needed for years. They have had to close their books already, and 75% of their patients <clears throat> are non-national. So it actually was of no benefit to the people of Bray, the indigenous people of Bray, because they still don't have a, a doctor. And the problem is that we've increased the population in this country from 3.5 million to over 5 million in less than 20 years. We haven't built one hospital in that period. We haven't built enough houses in that period. We haven't built enough roads to, to in that period. We haven't, in Dublin, for instance, the population has increased by, by maybe half a million. We don't have one more water supply coming into Dublin than we had 20, 30 years ago. The last time we built a reservoir in this country was down in Pula Fuca, which was sometime in the 60s. They're talking about bringing water to Dublin from the Shannon for the past 30 years, and they're still talking about it. We don't have an efficient public transport system. So if you, if you want to um, increase the population by that amount, then you have to put in the infrastructure in order to deal with it. It's not good enough to say to people who are on the housing waiting list here or living in emergency accommodation um, for the past number of years, well, you hang on there because Johnny's coming in from South Africa or Johnny's coming in from Somalia and he's going to have 20 kids and he needs a house before you. That's not the way society works. That's how society ends up getting broken down. And we're not integrating people. We're building ghettos, just as we did with social housing before. We built ghettos and we didn't put any, any um, facilities into them. We just dumped people into them because we wanted to move them out of somewhere else. And if you look through Dublin, I mean, in, in the north inner city, the numbers of non-nationals is over 60%. And that is a huge percentage change in a small area in a very small, very short amount of time. So it's nothing to do with uh, race. It's nothing to do with colour. But it has to do with capacity and the amount of uh, the, the structures that we have to deal with. It. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that the left fully support open borders and the importation of, of people from anywhere. And mainly 
I mean, it's not the doctors and the surgeons we're getting. It's people who are coming in to work in shops and people to work in, in, in low paid jobs to drive down the cost of labour. And the trade union movement in Britain was set up in the early part of the, the last century in order to stop migration into Britain, at a lo to, which was designed to drive down the cost of labour. And, it, you know, it's amazing that both the the what would have previously been the right wing, the, 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 the establishment and the so-called left both agree on importation pe important people to drive down the cost of labour. And it mm -hmm. seems that while the business class would think that that's something good, you would have thought the labour movement would think it was something bad. But they're so caught up in gender politics and all of this woke ideology that, you know, that's all they see. Well, when you when you notice that this problematic of mass immigration has suddenly hit the United States, has hit European countries over the last ten years, and with the U.S. and Ireland in particular in the, in the last uh, three to four years, and it's 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 notable that it's all happened at the same time, and I fully agree with you with regards to <clears throat> the cheap labor aspect of things, that we were in a time of high inflation where naturally workers will demand more wages because they can't survive with that, with that raising, rising prices. And as a result, when they demand more wages, if they don't get them, they can go on strike. And I believe that the mass importation of labour settles that and, and deals with that on the part of the, the business people of, of the country, not in a particularly nice way because it leaves people struggling even more. But is there also an issue around the concept of the nation state and how mass immigration into countries like Ireland. So, so we have already, as you outlined, population, significant demographic changes, upwards of demographic changes over the last five to six years. Um, but every single person coming in here as an asylum applicant, etc., when they're successful, they can actually invite many, many family members. And we don't even know if these people are family members. We don't know if these people are actually taking a payment to take somebody in and say they're a family member. Thing, things like this. But it, it erodes, to my mind, the national identity, because the national identity is also composed, is it not, of a national shared history, a national understanding, things like that. So I agree with you with the labour issue. Do you feel, as I do, that there's also an issue of sovereignty here because we have global institutions that are taking more and more control from the sovereign state? And ideally, if you've got a nation of people that are just feel they're in a rat race looking after themselves and their families and nobody else, and they have no historical connection, the likelihood of them resisting uh, the abandonment of the nation state by our politicians is far, far less likely. Do you believe that there's anything in that? I, I think it's totally uh, correct. And I mean, the whole concept of the European Union and the move towards a federal, federal state of Europe is about doing away with independent nationhood. They just want a, a nation of, of people, of consumers, in fact, who have no allegiance to anything. I mean, if you if you talk, think, think of, of somebody who flees, even if they are an asylum seeker or a refugee and they're fleeing war, shouldn't they stay and fight for their own country? Whatever about sending the women and children out, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't the men be saying to fight for their own country? But if, if you have a population in this country that has no connection to the cultural values that we have had for thousands of years, then you don't have a nation. And there's there's this attempt to dilute everything we have. You see it even in subtle ways with, with say, the rugby team not singing the national anthem and singing that Irish call and using, for instance, the the the, the tricolor and giving it equal parity to um the old star flag with the crown on it, you know, when they're not two, two distinct nations. But sovereignty is the key to all of this. And we have to assert our sovereignty. And there seems to be a political class in this country and an NGO class who are beholden. It's not even that they're beholden to, to Europe and to Brussels. They're beholden to themselves. And it seems it seems to be somewhat more than just about the money. But they seem to hate everything that this country is everything that it was and everything that it stands for. And if you look at even the arguments around taking religion out of the schools, and religion is not simply a um, learning subject. It gave us, and it didn't matter whether you're Catholic or Protestant up till, till now, but it gave you a moral fabric. It gave the moral guidance to the nation. 
And we've replaced that now with wokeism. And we've used the abuses that no doubt that, that you know, some members of the clergy and that were involved in. They've used that in order to attempt to destroy the whole concept of what Irishness is. And I, I don't mind what religion people are, but a nation and this nation was seen to be Catholic. That doesn't mean everybody goes to mass, but it means it comes from that Judean Christian tradition where people, like people don't not kill people. Nobody goes out and commits murder because it's against the law. Or rather doesn't commit murder because the law says don't commit murder. They don't do it because intrinsically they know it's wrong. And it wouldn't matter if the law was changed tomorrow to say you can go out and shoot your neighbour. I don't think most people would go out and shoot their neighbours. Um, so people have this inbuilt moral fibre, which stems from that Judean Christian tradition, which goes back thousands of years. And they want to do away with and dilute our culture. If you look at even, for instance, the song that they're sending to the Eurovision, which has nothing to do with either this nation, you know, bring back Dana, or even bring back Dustin is probably better. Um, but it has nothing, it represents only the woke tradition in this country. It doesn't represent ordinary, decent people. And I suggest that most people won't even look at the programme. I think most people got turned off the Eurovision years ago. Um, but when you have a political class that clearly despises anything that relates to this nation, anything that relates to its culture. And they will say that somebody like me, because of the things I've said, is a right-wing fascist. Now, I don't think anything that I have said to you today could be in any way construed as being right-wing fascism. It could be seen, perhaps, I would say, as centrist. And that somebody who believes in their own nation, somebody who believes, I believe that this country can be the best little country in the world if we set our minds to it. Does that make me a supremacist? Well, perhaps it does, but I don't see what's wrong with that. You know, we have to have a, a society that's based on uh, meritocracy, not on um, diversity and not on inclusiveness and not, not on all of those things. People should get to the positions they're in because they're capable to get there, not because of their gender or their ideology or to fill quotas and tick, tick boxes. Look at what we have as Taoiseach at the minute. A man who is an out-and-out clown who you couldn't believe a word out of his mouth, a man who, for instance, in the last uh, general election, wrote to the pro-life movement and said, I will stand by the unborn children. I won't vote or support any legislation um, that tries to remove the Eighth um, Amendment. And that was a solemn promise he made in the letter. And as soon as he went in, not alone did he do that, or not do that, rather, he was the biggest cheerleader. So... He was Somebody. the one that actually signed the bill in as, as the minister at the time. Just pulling back to the, the issue of mass immigration and the attempts at labelling people. Uh, and I do know those other issues are another corner of the same wokeism house, if you want to put it like that. But just on the issue of mass Im immigration itself, I've heard politicians say that people don't have a right to decide who moves into their neighbourhood. And if we were to magnify that out or, or elongate that principle does it also infer that people don't have a right to talk about their change in culture they talk about the impact of mass immigration on their own communities and neighborhoods but even visually the impact of it that people don't have a right to, to talk about that but they seem to have a right not only to talk about it but to decide about it and to and to negotiate it in brussels and in other uh, big international meetings that are behind closed doors that we don't hear about until the policy is actually being implemented. So and, uh, do we have a right to talk about these things? Do you feel? Well, look, I, I feel, of course, we, we have a right to do it. And I, 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 I debate with you whether they actually negotiate out in Brussels because it seems to me that they just take whatever they're told and they just come and do it. But, you know, when they say you don't have a right to, to say who lives in your community, if somebody puts in for a plan of permission for a 20 story building beside my house or in my community, you can go through the plan and le legislation and you can object. Now, maybe it'll still happen or maybe it won't, you know, but you have the right to not decide, but to be involved and to be consulted. What they don't, they've changed the plan and laws to say we can turn any building we want into accommodation for asylum seekers. But when, we, when they said that and we put it to them and we went over to Balls Bridge, I think it was in February 2023, and we said, there's juries 
the old Jory's Hotel, 120 rooms in it. There's the old Israeli embassy. There's another building opposite that. Why is there no asylum seekers in those? You know, if, if every community is to take its fair share, why is there nobody in, in, in that part of Dublin 4? Now, they come up with the figures and say, oh, there's so many hundreds in Dublin 4, but it's the Rings End part of Dublin 4, it's the working class part of Dublin 4 that they're in. Why are all of these asylum centres concentrated in working class areas, whether it's East Wall, um, Rings End, where they try to put it in, whether it's uh, Tala, where they're trying to put it in now, whether it's Kulak, they're trying to put it into now. It's all working class communities and it's all areas where people already are at a loss for the services that they never had in the first place. And we need to put into all of our communities uh, doctors, nurses, primary care centres, schools. I mean, they, they talk for years about bringing down the uh, numbers of children in classes. Now that's gone through the roof because there's so many children coming in that they can't do that. They can't get the teachers or they can't get the nurses because the teachers <clears throat> are having to emigrate because they can't afford to live here. And it's not acceptable. And and, and this is where this feeds out into the, the, the upper working class or the old working class, because a lot of the working class now was, is the welfare class. But the, the ordinary old working class, which are now to some extent, the lower middle classes are now finding that their children who have uh, gone to school, been educated, gone and become nurses and doctors and teachers and even guards, find that they can't afford to, to buy a house here and never will, can't afford to rent here, are having to emigrate. I mean, we saw two weeks ago the, the Australian police force coming over here to recruit Gardaí and telling them what a fabulous life they'd have over in Australia. And there's no doubt that many of them will go. Our nurse is the same. And then we're told, oh, well, the health service wouldn't exist if we didn't bring in all these nurses from the Philippines. Now, nobody has a difficulty with people um, coming in on a visa route where they apply for a job, they get a job, and then they get a visa to come in. But how can we sustain and support a situation where you're saying to Mrs. Murphy, well, your daughter can flick off on a plane to, to du Dubai or Australia as a nurse because she can't afford to live here. But we're going to bring in somebody from the Philippines or somewhere else to do her job. Like, that is not how you build a country. That's not how you build a nation. That's actually how you destroy it and how you ensure that um, our own indigenous people don't have a quality of life here. And when people leave this time, they're not coming back. It's going just to be like that. Just on that issue, Maliki, of who exactly are these mass immigrants? Because when you look at the stats about asylum applicants and refugees, it's like uh, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. And yet we're talking about hundreds of thousands per year. So who is the rest of them? Or who are the rest of them? Well, and many of them are coming in on work visas or in student visas. They're working dead end jobs. The, the jobs that we're told Irish people won't do, but I've, I've got a feeling that plenty of young Irish people would actually do, uh, especially Irish people who maybe young Irish people who haven't gone to college, uh, maybe aren't doing an apprenticeship and need a bit of an income from working class areas. So who are these people? Because it's not all asylum. In fact, I, I argue that the majority of them are not asylum or refugee applicants. Yeah, well, I think that the, the main problem that people have is the asylum applicants because they're given free housing, they're given um, welfare. And it's it's a it's the abuse of the welfare system that I think people have the initial problem with. <clears throat> when you look at the, the people who are coming in through the other migratory routes to do jobs, they have to pay their way. And if they don't get a job, they don't eat basically. But isn't it true that if we are genuinely concerned about capacity, they are taking up houses. They are that, and yeah. they're, they're working in jobs. So we don't have a managed economy here. It's a it's a laissez faire neoliberal economy. Anybody can set up set up any type of business. And we're for a lot of cases we're producing crap. We have young fellas, immigrants coming in who are walking around doors in the states, knocking doors, trying to sell crap, and that's yeah, considered and, to be a job. I mean, it's but it's the same way we real. have. People used to go to the shops themselves. Now they get it from delivery. You know, so they've created an, in, an industry which is pop, which is very badly paid, which is in terms of the delivery drivers, it's quite dangerous because the roads, particularly in Dublin, are a nightmare um, to try and... But my point is that around. if that delivery delivery driver, he has to have a bed somewhere, yeah. or she has to have a bed somewhere, has taken up a bed. For for what? 
uh, in terms of the, the real contribution to, to the economy. They, if they have an accident on their bicycle, they will go and they will wait in a waiting room and take up a place in a waiting room. For what is the benefit to the average person in this country? Because it seems to me it's benefiting business people. But in terms of people who have to access independent services, it's a detriment to them. Yeah, as I mean, far, as far as I if can you see. go to, to any hospital, a, va- a huge amount of the people in the waiting room will be non-nationals. Now, that's okay if you're in Spain, for instance, and you go into the hospital and you're only there an hour. Here, people are in A&E waiting to be seen for a day nearly. There are people then put on trolleys for a couple of days if, if, if they have to go into the hospital. You know, the system doesn't work, but it seems to me that no systems work in this country. Nothing actually works. You know, you take even simple things um, that, that should work. Like applying for a passport should be a relatively simple matter. Yet you have politician after politician, and they'll tell you that the biggest amount of requests they get from constituents is to chase up their passport. Getting a medical card should be a simple matter. You apply, you qualify, you get it. If you don't, you don't. We're told, for instance, getting a driving license in this country, getting a driving test takes months, if not years in some places. Um, Like we don't seem to be able to do anything correctly. You take even, um, they talk about carbon taxes and that's another story for another, um, Mm. another day. But, you know, how does charging me or you an extra 10 cents a litre on diesel to drive from Dundalk to Dublin change anything other than that you're, you've lost that money. It doesn't change because you still have to drive. Your car is still going to use the same amount of diesel. And again, and, it's another policy that seems to be coming from outside of the state and being supplanted within our, our government chambers. Uh, two more questions. But what we do actually is, while the policies come from outside the state initially, we seem to be gung ho to, to implement them at a double the rate almost of what the other people decide to do. So there's this, they're like Christian crusaders in the old days. They're zealots, particularly on the, on the climate change agenda, you know, and all of that nonsense, which somehow says that if you pay more tax, the climate is going to be better. You know, it, it, it doesn't work. Yet, Ryan will pop off business class to wherever and does more damage. And, you know, if you believe all that rubbish, does more damage in a week with his air miles than me and you will do in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Just, just coming back to the development uh, protest movement against mass immigration. And I've just got two more questions. And I know you've got a meeting at five o'clock, so we'll have to let you go. But in terms of it seems to be quite organic at the moment. Uh, communities just organizing themselves. There has been a few incidents where or events where those communities have come together in the Dublin area. Is there any kind of manifestation of uh, centralization or at least a coming together, not only of the Dublin based movements, but the movements that are developing in Waterford and Cork and Mayo and right across the country, even in Donegal? Does, is there a sign that these guys are meeting up to create something grander? Well, well, obviously, there are links and, and contacts between all of the groups right around the country. Um, I think that any coalescing of groups will come in time and that will start, in my view, that that shouldn't start till after the elections because people will need to see how things stand then. But, I mean, we do have a major rally coming up on the next bank holiday, the 6th of May in Dublin, and we're, you know, hoping to have many thousands there. We have almost 5,000 there in in February at a rally. Um, But this movement is unlike any other movement anywhere in Europe. This is a genuine grassroots movement. And people have compared it to the water tax thing and all of that. There's no comparison because the water tax protests were led by political figures trying to gain a foothold. And it was led from that and you had the trade union movement and all of these uh, political actors who were just trying to carve out a niche for themselves who, who led that and mobilised people. This is, and we have purposely left this not leaderless, but let's say with the appearance of leaderless. Um, that every com- because there's no point in me going out, going to Dundalk, for instance, and saying, you come out here and protest. Um, that's not how it works, because 
people might come out and protest if I go down or somebody else goes down and organizes it. But as soon as you're gone, so is the protest. It needs to be, and we've seen this succeed everywhere, that people themselves say enough is enough and are coming out in large numbers in areas. Now, later on this evening, I'll be out in Tallow where the latest, um, just to give them some, some support and guidance and um, their protests and there since last week. The Crown Paints uh, place in, in Coolock, people are protesting there for the past couple of weeks. Newtown and Kennedy, I'll be down there tomorrow. They're um, protesting for the past couple of weeks as well. I mean, the whole forces of the state are coming against them. And even down there over the weekend, and remember the police are sitting there. There was a fire in the building. And I don't believe that any of these fires have anything to do with anybody on our side of the fence. Because they will be counterproductive for a start and it allows the state to paint as, as violent people and, and arsonists and all that. I believe that these are being done by, by state actors. And we know, for instance, that in Kulov, um, a news talk journalist came along with a number of other people masked up to in, in an attempt two weeks ago to intimidate people there and start trouble. And they were chased off and he dropped his phone and the information is out there on for what he was at and the, the news talk have admitted that he was there and they said this was legit, legitimate journalism that he was acting undercover to infiltrate the far right but he wasn't with what he called the far right he was actually with the far left trying to create um violence in the same way as when we had the rally in february we had intended going from the from um, the gardener remembrance to the customs house via parnell street the left had organized a counter protest at the spire in o'connell street and we had made it clear we weren't going to get into a confrontation with anybody because we would come out with bad pr out of that women and children could have been injured and anything could have happened the police forced their rally down o'connell street past there and it was only for the the bravery of our stewards who stood between the guardy the, the counter riot and our protest that violence was averted and we're not, you know, so the, the state is very clearly attempting to start violence at these things in order to, to not to discourage people like me from going on a rally, but to discourage Mrs. Morphy and our children coming along mm. because they don't want the wider people, wider section of community, of society standing up. They think they can deal with people like us. On a final note, Maliki. Calling people far right is actually really serious because the far right br bring connotations of Nazis, of lynchings in Mississippi in the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s. Those kind of connotations. And when you point at somebody and call them far right, you're actually putting a target on their back in many ways. You're saying that this person is in some way less human, doesn't have the human qualities of kindness or empathy or think that that's what you're saying when you call someone far right and it's a very dangerous thing to do coming from the state coming from corporate media it's even more dangerous because it's magnified and amplified amplified so much in terms of the way you guys are responding to being accused of being far right in other words connotations of nazism and and, and the ku klux klan I, I, have you come up with a distinct response to that, that that deals with that matter straight off? Well, I, I think that they play overplayed their hand on that, you know, and when people and certainly the intention that they had in calling us all those names was to say these people are only short of shoving people into gas chambers, because that's what people see when they see the far right. They think of Nazism and Hitler and all of that. But they used it for so long against the wrong people that it now has no value. So it doesn't matter. People just, and some of our people will actually just call themselves the far right now, you know, even though they're not because they use it just to turn it back on them. And, you know, that's why we changed the logo for this movement to Women With Prams. You know, that was the logo that we adopted, I think, early last year when they started calling us fascists. So the women with the prams and the children, you know, and, and that's why at, at most of the protests, and rallies we had women and children up the front you know so people know so you can call people all the names you want but when people don't believe them 
And nobody believes, nobody believes that anything I have ever said is far right. The only people who call me far right are woke liberals because they won't actually debate anything. And their way of closing down the debate and not discussing people's real concerns is to say, well, he's far right, he's fascist and all of these things. And, you know, it doesn't matter because mainstream media who have these debates or used to have these debates is no longer relevant. Social media, and this is why they want to bring in legislation now to effectively shut down social media and why they're talking about taking phones off kids. It's not because they don't want kids to have phones because they've no problem up till now with, with some of the rubbish and they've no problem with the indoctrination that they're giving them in schools and various different things. But they want to stop those kids when they're becoming teenagers actually listening to people like us who are given a different narrative and they don't want to get them to be getting their news feeds from people who are out on the streets who have put up a live stream video so people can actually see what's happening in an unedited form. Whereas you go to RTE, again, as I said just, uh, earlier, the documents that were released to GRIP yesterday, which they published, should, be, should have brought this government down. There is nowhere else in the world that political actors and politicians and a government would survive actually lying in such a blatant, coherent way to the people. And then the people seeing through that and rejecting at 76% the proposals in the referendum. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, a government who is prepared to lie to its people, a government who is prepared to, in yesterday's statement from Joe O'Brien, to allocate 3 million to dodgy NGOs in order to, to try and buy people's votes for the election, isn't fit to be in office. And until we have fundamental change in this country, and a fundamental realignment of what we actually stand for and what we mean, then this country is finished. And we are re really on the last chance. This is last chance saloon. We have to make an impact in June. And people have to come out and vote to change the direction that this country is going in, or there will be no nation. Uh, so we have a demo uh, on the 6th of May. Could you give us details about location and things like right, that? Right, well, we're meeting up at the Garden of Remembrance at half two. On the, it's the new, it's the May bank holiday. So um, people will be off work. So um, they should make their way to Dublin. Um, we won't divulge actually where we're going at, at, at this stage, but people are assembling at the Garden of Remembrance, which is where, where we normally assemble in Parnell Square um, in the city centre. And Malachi, just a final comment from you. If there are people who are thinking that they would like to go, but maybe have fears or concerns, whether those concerns are clashes with the far left or, or the, the left, or whether those concerns are about being labelled or being perceived as far right, what would you say to them to encourage them to overcome those concerns? Well, well firstly, don't do it for yourself. Do it for your children and your grandchildren. Because people of our generation, our generation is gone, it's lost. And we probably maybe 20 year left if we even have that. It's for your children and grandchildren. And if you're not prepared to run the risk of a bit of shouting at you to create and save the nation for your children, you know, you need to look in the mirror. People need to get out on the streets. People need to come along. Don't mind the, the, the naysayers and the begrudgers and the moaners and the left. Do this for your children and grandchildren and say, because you don't want, and your listeners don't want surely, in 20 years or 30 years, when they're sitting there with their grandchildren and your grandchildren says to you, well, what did you do when the country was being destroyed? Do you want to really sit there and say, oh, well, Jay, I just sat at home and watched a football match or I was watching Coronation Street because that was more important. You know, get out there, stand up, and do something. It's only a couple of hours on that day. As I say, pride before the fall. It might be pride that's that's actually stopping some people from going out on the street. What will people think about me? But in reality, pride before the fall. We'll always remember that. Malachi, I'm Steve... sure when you go on that rally that your neighbours who will also be gone feel the very same way. And, you know, talk to the man next door. Ask him, is he going? Go together. You know, bring your kids. You know, this is about saving our nation. It's not just simply 
a minor issue like water tax, which is about money just really at the end of the day. This is about the nation. And this is about ensuring that there is something of our nation left for our children. Malachi Steenson, thanks for joining us today. I hope you'll join us in the near future, especially as we advance closer towards the local and the European elections. But for now, stay safe, Malachi, and we hope to have a team up from M Compass Media on the 6th. And we'll be doing interviews with people around the place just to highlight the fact that the most people that we in M Compass Media have interviewed in the past with, from communities who are demonstrating are reasonable people. They're certainly not Nazis. They're not Ku Klux Klan. So we hope to have a team up there as well. In the meantime, you be safe, uh, Malachi, and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Finbar. I look forward to seeing you then. No problem.